Hello, Complex Analysis students. The topic for today is limits. So we're going to start off by giving the technical definition of limit. I have to confess that this is one of the more technical lessons that we'll have probably all quarter. The definition of limit is hard to get your head around if you haven't seen it before. If you, Even if you have seen it before, it's still a bit of a handful. So the idea is, is that we'll introduce this technical definition of limit, and then we'll use that technical definition of limit to develop techniques and theorems that allow us to compute limits and deal with limits in, in more of a computational, less proofy manner. As we move on a little bit forward, we'll also start talking about limits at infinity and infinite limits. But it turns out that we can define these things in such a way that it's very unified and it seems like all the one same concept. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started on this technical definition of the limit. All right, so for our definition of limit, we start with a point Z0 in the complex plane. That's where the point at which we're going to take the limit. And then we have to have a, the function is defined on some deleted neighborhood of Z0. So that just means that the function is defined maybe not at Z0, but definitely all around Z0. And then we say that f of z has a limit of w0 as z approaches z0. And then we have the familiar limit notation here. Limit f of z, got the z arrow z0 below the limit, means z is going to z0. And then the limit is w0. This means, precisely, I'll just go ahead and write it out, the, the technical version of it, and I'll try to explain what it means a little bit. But it means that for every epsilon, greater than zero, there exists some other positive number, delta, such that the following is true for every complex number z. If you take a z value that is delta close to z naught, that's captured by this inequality, that implies that f of z is epsilon close to w naught, which is captured by this inequality. So the idea is, if you think w naught is the limit of f of z as z goes to z naught, then you can take any error tolerance epsilon, that's why it's called epsilon, right? Epsilon for error. Take any sort of tolerance that you like around w naught. Then there has to exist some corresponding tolerance delta around z naught so that if you pick a z within delta, within a distance of delta of z naught, then when you plug that z into the function, the output will be within that tolerance epsilon of w naught. So when you think about it that way, you can kind of state what you mean by the limit in a less formal way. So when we say the limit of f of z as z goes to z naught equals w naught, it just means that we can make f of z as close to w naught as we like. So this is the part about epsilon. Making f of z as close to w naught as we like is making modulus f of z minus w naught less than epsilon. If we choose z sufficiently close to, but not equal to, z naught. And that's the part about delta. So z being sufficiently close to z naught, but not equal to z naught, is the zero less than z minus z naught less than delta business. You can visualize that down at the bottom here. And we can also, while we're at it, put it into a slightly different language involving neighborhoods that's a little more concise. On the right picture, there's an epsilon neighborhood around w naught, which is the blue dashed circle. We want our outputs to be inside that blue dashed circle. So if the limit exists, then we can go back to the left around z naught, and we can find a delta sized disk around z naught that doesn't include z naught. So we should have like a little open circle there at z naught. But if you take any z inside that yellow deleted disk, then when you plug it into the function, it's going to fall within the blue dash circle on the right side. So if you do that for all the points in yellow, it might turn out to be some sort of blob, sort of amorphous looking blob, but the output of that yellow disk, st it stays entirely inside that blue circular disk on the right. So the idea is that if you take the, the yellow disk on the left and insert the whole thing into the function as an image, then that image is inside that disk over there. So we can write that using the language of neighborhoods and, and uh, images over here. So reformulating the, the limit definition, it would be something like this. So the limit of f of z equals w naught if for every epsilon greater than zero, there exists a delta greater than zero. 
such that when you take the deleted neighborhood centered at Z naught of radius delta and put that inside the function as I've done there, the result will be contained in the neighborhood of W naught of radius epsilon. So this neighborhood of W naught of radius epsilon is this disk over here, and this um, left-hand side is the yellow am amorphous blob over here inside that disk. This kind of gives you a nice sort of geometric way to think about what the limit is. It's a technical definition, and it takes some practice getting accustomed to. If you've taken an, anal an analysis class before this class, you'll have a bit more experience with epsilons and deltas. And if this is the first time you've ever seen this, this is going to be a little scary. But you can do it with some practice. So let's start that practice now. So in this problem that I want to work, I want to prove a certain limit. So I've got a function f of z equals i z divided by 2. And I want to prove that when you take the limit of that function as z approaches 1, you get i divided by 2. Now I don't think the answer to you know, what that limit worked out to be is all that surprising. We're just substituting 1 in place of z in the function and getting i over 2. But we want to prove it. We want to prove that this limit is what we're claiming it is. And that involves the epsilon delta definition of the limit. The way that you usually do these limits is you sort of reverse engineer. In the definition of limit, there was an inequality f of z minus w naught is less than epsilon. That's the conclusion that you want in the limit definition. So you start from the conclusion and work backwards to figure out what the hypothesis must have been. And that tells you what your delta has to be for a given epsilon. So you start the scratch work by saying, well, let's say epsilon is greater than zero. And you know what we want eventually is for, for z's that are within delta of z naught, which is 1 in this case, we want the modulus of f of z minus w naught to be less than epsilon. We just don't know what delta will force that to happen yet, and that's what we're going to figure out in our scratch work. Now f of z in this case is i z over 2, so I put that inside that modulus, and our w naught, the limit, is i over 2. So we want that modulus to be less than epsilon. So we're going to manipulate this inequality to figure out how close z has to be to 1 to make it happen. And we'll start that by process by factoring out i over 2 inside that modulus. And then we can use the property of modulus that says the modul modulus of a product is the product of the moduli. So we can write that left-hand side of this inequality like so. Now the modulus of i over 2 is really just 1 half. So this is 1 half times the modulus of z minus 1 is less than epsilon. And if I multiply both sides by 2, I get modulus of z minus 1 is less than 2 epsilon. Now look, this inequality that we have at the end here is telling us if z is within 2 times epsilon of 1, then if we work backwards, we'll get that the modulus of f of z minus w naught is less than epsilon at the top. So if we kind of like read this thing this way, then we know how close z has to be to 1 to get what we want. And then it also tells us what our delta is. Delta is this quantity here. So now if I want to do a proof, having already reversed engineered what the delta has to be for a given epsilon, I'll start my proof by saying, well, let's let epsilon be greater than 0. And I'm going to choose delta to be equal to 2 times epsilon, which is certainly greater than 0. Now, if you didn't see the scratch work, you'd be like, where's he getting that 2 epsilon stuff? You wouldn't know where I got it, but you'll see that it works in just a second because now I can say something along the lines of now for z in the complex numbers satisfying 0 less than modulus z minus 1 less than delta, which, by the way, is equal to 2 epsilon, just as a reminder. So we're saying for z's that are within delta of 1, we have, now we're going to look at this modulus f of z minus w naught. So that's our modulus of i times z over 2, and our w naught was the limit i over 2. And at this point, we're just going to repeat the same uh, manipulation of the modulus expression that we did in the scratch work. We're going to pull that i over 2 out. We're going to use the nice property of modulus to break it into 2 moduli product. We're going to remember that that's equal to 1 half there. So 1 half modulus z minus 1. Now, we've got this hypothesis that z minus 1 is less than delta. So I can say, well, this expression right here is certainly less than 1 half times delta. 
but then we remember that delta is in turn equal to two times epsilon, and those twos cancel and I get epsilon. Okay, so when you look at the grand total of what's gone on here, we, we showed that f of z minus w naught is strictly less than epsilon. And that's what we needed the conclusion to be from the definition of limit. We started with an arbitrary epsilon. We showed that there exists a delta that's positive, in particular 2 times epsilon, and that whenever z is within delta of 1, but not equal to 1, then the f of z minus w naught in modulus was less than epsilon. And so that's it. We've proven that the limit does in fact equal i over 2, as advertised. Now these sort of proofs get more compli complicated as you start working with more complicated functions. I mean, this function that we did here was a linear function, and all linear functions would be proven in a very similar way. And then, you know, you could think about quadratic functions. They're a little bit harder. Not a ton harder, but a little harder. And then, you know, they get harder and harder as you start doing higher degree polynomials, just because the algebra starts to get tricky. And of course, we even haven't even defined things like trigonometric functions and exponential functions and logarithms and things like that for complex numbers. But the point is, is that, you know, in principle, we can prove limits doing epsilons and deltas. But it's not going to be easy, typically. So what we want to have is, you know, some general results that will enable us to calculate limits in a rigorous way that, in such a way that the calculation itself constitutes a proof of the limit. And so we'll work toward doing these sort of theorems that make the computation rigorous and easy. The first one of these kinds of theorems is, first of all, just noting that limits, when they exist, are unique. This is actually useful in proving when limits do not exist, because you can do the contrapositive of this. If you show that some expression has two different limits, then that limit must not exist. So let's prove this. Limits are unique. Usually when you want to prove something's unique, you suppose that you have more than one of them and then show that those separate things have to be equal. So let's try that approach here. So suppose that limit exists, and let's suppose that that limit has two different values. The limit of f of z as z approaches z naught is equal to w naught, and that limit as z approaches z naught of f of z is equal to, let's say, w1. Now, we want to prove that w naught equals w1 here. So let me write that down as a want to show sort of thing. WTS, want to show w naught equals w1. In analysis classes, there's a standard trick for proving two numbers are equal, and that's to show that the difference between the two numbers in modulus is less than any positive value. So if we start, we're going to start with an arbitrary positive value and show that the difference between w naught and w1 has to be in modulus less than that arbitrary epsilon. So we're going to start with this epsilon greater than zero, and again, parenthetically, I'm going to I'm going to show that modulus w naught minus w1 is less than epsilon for any positive epsilon. Okay, so the way I'm going to argue that that inequality is true in parentheses above is I'm going to first note that, well, if epsilon is positive, then epsilon over 2 is some positive number 2. And because we know the limit as z approaches z naught of f of z equals w naught, then I can employ the definition of limit to say, well, there has to exist some delta greater than zero, such that for every z satisfying zero less than mod z minus z naught less than delta, we have modulus f z minus w naught is less than epsilon divided by two. I'm doing epsilon over two here because I'm going to use the triangle inequality in a in a little bit, and a couple of things are going to add together, and so I want to get a one-half plus a one-half equals one sort of thing. But don't worry about that for now. Right now, you just need to note that epsilon over 2 is a positive value, and so I can use it as the epsilon in the definition of limit, and so I get that. And then similarly, because we know the limit as z approaches z naught of f of z is equal to z1, or w1, 
there exists a delta. Hmm. I called that first delta just delta. Maybe I'll call it delta naught just because it'll correspond to the W naught. And then I'm going to call this delta. It's not maybe not the same delta as the previous delta. I'll call it delta one to correspond to W one. There exists a delta one greater than zero, such that for every z in the complex number satisfying zero less than mod z minus z naught less than delta one, we have modulus f of z minus w one is less than epsilon over two again. So now we've got these two deltas in play, and I'm going to choose delta, just regular delta without a subscript, to be equal to the minimum of these two deltas. So certainly delta is less than or equal to delta 1, and delta is less than or equal to delta 2. And now we can say that if we got some complex number that satisfies that it's within delta of z naught, which parenthetically here I'm just going to add, you know, that's less than or equal to delta 1 or delta 2, then we get both of these inequalities about the f of z's is satisfied simultaneously. So for these z's that we're looking at at the bottom, I know that this inequality is true and this inequality is true. Both of these inequalities highlighted in blue here are true for the z's that I'm currently considering. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to take the difference between w naught and w1, and I want to relate it to those inequalities that I have in blue up there. So what I'm going to do is introduce a well-chosen zero. So I'm going to write this as w minus f of z plus f of z minus w1. So introduce the old well-chosen zero trick. And then I'm going to do the triangle inequality and write this as w naught minus f of z plus I got f of z minus w1. And I can certainly just take that first modulus expression and change the order of the terms inside there because that just amounts to factoring out a negative 1 and then taking the modulus of the negative 1 just gives you a 1 so you can, you can get away with this. And then now I can use the expressions in blue the first term in my sum here is less than epsilon over 2 by the first inequality highlighted in blue at the top. And the second one's less than epsilon over 2 for by the second highlighted inequality. So this is less than epsilon over 2 plus epsilon over 2, which is equal to epsilon. So here's what we see. W0 minus W1 is strictly less than epsilon, and epsilon was an arbitrarily chosen positive quantity. So even if epsilon is, you know, 1 1 billionth, w naught minus w1 is less than that. So since it's true for all possible ep positive epsilons, this tells us that w naught has to equal w to 1. And that's our proof. So the limits are unique because if you have two values pretending to be the limit, they end up having to be equal. So let me show you how you can use the uniqueness of limits to help you prove that limits do not exist. So here's a function, z conjugate over z. It's a perfectly good function. You can plug numbers into it. The only thing you can't plug into it is zero, of course. So the natural domain of this function is just all non-zero complex numbers. I want to prove that when you try to take the limit as z goes to zero, the limit does not exist. And the way we're going to handle this is similar to how you might have done this sort of thing in your multivariate calculus class. We're going to consider two different paths of approach toward zero. So z's can approach zero along a lot of different paths, and we'll consider z approaching zero along the x-axis, and then separately z approaching zero along the y-axis, and we'll see that you end up getting two different results. And because limits are unique, that would be a problem. So let's start, let's sort of go indirectly and suppose that that limit does exist. Now if that limit exists, it doesn't matter how z approaches zero. All that matters is that if you take values that are getting closer and closer to zero, the output values are going to, you know, end up being closer and closer to whatever the limit is. And it's going to be a unique thing that it gets close to. So first let's consider when z goes to zero along the x-axis. To do that, the limit as z goes to zero of f of z would be the limit. Let me think of those z's. If they're on the x-axis, they're of the form x comma zero. So z going to zero, I'm going to convert that to the ordered pair notation. So 
if we're doing it along the x-axis, it's points of the form x comma 0 going to 0 comma 0. And then what am I taking the limit of? Z conjugate is x minus 0 times i, and then z itself is x plus 0 times i. See, z is equal to, parenthetically over here, x plus iy, and then y is equal to 0 on the x-axis. So I'm just changing you know, to x and y notation for z conjugate and z, but I'm putting in 0 for y. And so this all just collapses to the limit as x goes to 0. There's no y, so I'm just going to focus on the variable x. And then you've got x over x inside the parentheses there. That's just 1. And so the limit as x approaches 0 of 1 is just 1. But if z approaches 0 along the y-axis, we get the limit as z approaches 0 of f of z. That would be the limit as 0, comma y. So points on the y-axis are of that form, 0, comma y. And then our function z conjugate over z becomes 0 plus, sorry, 0 minus iy over 0 plus iy. Again, in the original function, we got z is equal to x plus iy, but then we got x is equal to 0 on the y-axis. And then that's the same as just limit so y goes to 0. And then you see that inside the parentheses there, you've got negative iy over positive iy, so that's just negative 1. And the limit of negative 1 being a constant is just negative 1. But that's a contradiction. So then we can conclude that our original hypothesis must be false, that is, the limit as z goes to z naught of f of z does not exist. Okay, another limit theorem that is pretty useful is this theorem 1. What theorem 1 basically tells us that we can do is that if we want to take the limit of a complex function, then if we break that function up into its real and imaginary function parts, then to take the limit of f of z, it amounts to taking the limit of the u function and the v function separately. If we work out what those limits are, here and here, then we can get the limit of f of z, and this is an if and only if statement, the limit as z approaches z naught of f of z will just be u naught plus i times v naught. u naught and v naught are the limits of the component functions. So it's telling us we can get the limit of the complex value function by evaluating the limits of, it, of its component functions separately. So i.e., the way I think about this is that this is saying limit as z goes to z naught of f of z is the same as taking the limit. Well, we're going to switch over to x and y notation because we're going to break it up into its component functions. Let's call that point z naught, x naught, y naught, like we did in the theorem up there. And then we're taking the limit of u of x comma y plus i times v of x comma y. So then, you know, this theorem is just saying, hey, you can distribute that limit over that sum and write it like this, which is that u plus i times v naught. But I, th I think the expression that comes just before that, this is the way, you know, in my mind, this is what this theorem is saying. I can evaluate that limit of the complex function by breaking it into the component functions and taking the limits of the component functions. But also, if, if you know the limits of the component functions, then you get the limit of the complex function. But also, if you know the limit of the component function, then it also tell, tells you about the limits of the com component functions. So anyway, it goes both ways. It's an if and only if. I'm not going to prove this. You can reference the book for the proof of it. It's really not super hard to prove. But let me show you how you can make use of it. So let's say I want to take this limit here at the bottom of the screen. Limit as z approaches 1 plus 2i of z squared. And I don't want to have to use epsilons and deltas and that sort of stuff to say, okay, you know, here's what the limit is. I want to just rely on some computational technique that in and of itself constitute a proof. To get the answer here, let me think of z as x plus iy. So that z squared, well, if you square that out, you'd get x squared minus y squared plus i times 2xy. And you can see what the two component functions are of z of the function z squared. The u component, the real component, is x squared minus y squared, and the v component, the imaginary component, is v comma y equals 2xy. 
And those are ordinary real valued functions of two variables that we can assume from our multivariate calculus class that we know how to take limits of. Limit of z squared as z approaches 1 plus 2i becomes, if we switch over to sort of ordered pairs, that would be x comma y is approaching 1 comma 2, right? 1 plus 2i is the ordered pair 1 comma 2. And then we'll take separately this limit x squared minus y squared plus, then we'll do i times the limit x comma y goes to 1 comma 2. And then we'll do take the limit of 2xy. So now we've got here these two separate real valued limits that that's the sort of stuff you learn in calculus class. And so we'll just use that prior knowledge to calculate these limits. Now of course these aren't hard to limits to evaluate. You learned in your calculus classes or in particular your multivariate calculus class that the limit of a polynomial function in two variables you can evaluate by direct substitution. And these are both polynomial functions so we'll evaluate them by direct substitution and you get 1 squared minus 2 squared on that first limit plus then you get i and then that second limit would be 2 times 1 times 2 for a grand total of negative 3 plus 4i is your limit. So it's a pretty cool theorem. It converts questions of limits of complex functions into questions of limits about real valued functions, which we already know how to do, allowing us to take, take advantage of what we already know. I like it. Here's a second theorem. This just gives you your basic limit laws like you've seen before in Calculus 1 and then in your multivariate for multivariable functions. When you take the limit of a sum of two functions and you know the limits of those two functions separately exist, then you can break that up into a limit of the first function plus separately the limit of the second function. It depends on knowing that both of those limits separately exist, otherwise the statement wouldn't make sense, right? And similarly, you can break up a limit of a product as a product of limits, and you can break up a limit of a quotient as a quotient of the limits, as long as the limit when you take in the de when you take the limit of the denominator, you don't get zero. So you can break the third one up here as limit f of z, z goes to z naught, over limit z goes to z naught, g of z, subject to that restriction there. Limit g of z is not equal to zero. Okay, so I don't think these are big surprises that these are theorems, but they do need to be proven in this new context of complex numbers. We could do each of these from the epsilon and delta definition of limit. The first one, part one, would not be hard to do from the epsilon delta definition. You would just take your delta to be the minimum of the two deltas from the separate limits. The product, product and quotient would be a little trickier. Let's take advantage of something we know. We got this theorem one that says if we want to talk about limits of complex valued functions, we can break it into the components and then use what we know about limits of real valued functions of two variables. And we know that limits of function, real valued functions of two variables have all these same properties. And so what we can do is just convert our limits to real valued limits and take advantage of what we already know. And that's how we're going to go about it. To prove the first part, of theorem 2, the sum law, I'm going to begin by just supposing that I've broken my first function f of z up into component functions u0 plus i times v0, and similarly g is going to be broken up into component functions u1 plus i times v1. We're looking at the limit as z goes to z0 of f of z plus g of z, and we want to break that up into two separate limits. So the way that we're going to manage that is to first inside the square brackets there I'm going to write my f of z as the u naught plus i times v naught. I'm going to write the g function as its sum of u1 x comma y plus v i times v1 x comma y. Now inside the square brackets there I can move things around a bit. I'm going to combine the real parts and by the way since I've switched from z and z naught, you know, I'm using x comma y, then I probably should change what I have under the limit to x comma y goes to x naught y naught. Okay, so inside the limit there, I'm going to put the u naught and the u1 together. So group those. Then I'm going to do i times, and I'm going to group the v parts together, the imaginary parts. And now the theorem 1 tells us that if we know that the limits of these two pieces, let me underline them here. If we know that the limits of these two pieces exist, 
which we do, because by hypothesis we know that the limit of the u naught and the u1, well, we had some hypotheses about those existing, because we know that the limit of f and g sep individually exist, so we know that the limits of its components individually exist. But we can use the theorem 1 to say, well, the things underlined in red, I can distribute the limit over to them. So I can write this as limit x comma y goes x naught y naught of u naught plus u1 plus i times the limit so x comma y goes to x naught y naught of v naught x comma y plus v1 x comma y and now we can take advantage of what we know about real valued limits so the limits that we have in play right here are regular old real valued limits and they have that sum property that we learned in multivariate calculus so I can break this up maybe I'll shorthand it a little bit write it as limit u naught plus limit u1 then I get plus i times limit v0 plus limit v1 then I could distribute the i and then recombine things like this limit u naught plus i limit v naught plus limit u1 plus i times the limit v1. In going from the part where I have it underlined in red to, to where it's sort of highlighted in green, I was using theorem 1, and I was using the fact that because the individual limits exist, I know that the limit of the u0, the u1, the v0, and the v1 all individually exist, and I can rearrange things, and yada yada. And then I'm going to use theorem 1 one last time here at the end, because now when you look at these limits, the first thing in the, the first set of parentheses is the limit of f of z, as z goes to z naught, according to theorem 1. And the second one would be the limit as z goes to z naught of g of z. So again, applying theorem 1. And then there you have it, because we've broken the limit up into two separate pieces. I did, in going from step to step on this thing, um, combine a few facts. I think it would be a good exercise for you to be sure you fill in the gaps of how I'm doing this proof. I think there's enough of a backbone of it there that you should be able to fill it in though. But it's just making use of theorem one a few times. And then it's also making use of when you have a, a sum of real valued functions and you're taking a limit, then you can break that into separate limits. So that's just something you know from calculus. So anyway, yeah, fill in the gaps on that. Make sure you understand it. But it's a lot easier doing this, even when after you fill in the gaps, than to do epsilons and deltas. And basically the same idea would work for the product and the quotient rules too. Here's a few other useful limit facts. I've got three really basic limits here that, well the first two you can prove from epsilon and delta very easily. The first one is just the constant rule. If you take the limit of a constant, doesn't matter what z is approaching there, z is approaching z naught, but it didn't matter. The limit of a constant is that constant. And also, if you're taking just the limit of z, as z goes to z naught, well, it's asking, what does z get close to as z gets close to z naught? Well, obviously, the answer is z naught, right? <laughs> but, you know, that's even though it seems kind of obvious, you can give a quick proof of it. It's Both of those um, two facts right there are very easy to prove using epsilons and deltas, and I encourage you to maybe even push pause right now and go do those proofs real quick, or at least do them later. At some point, do them. The third limit you can establish using a little mathematical induction, but it just says that when you take the limit as z approaches z naught of z to the nth power, you're gonna get z naught to the nth power. So that one follows from the second limit in yellow up there just by induction. We've got this polynomial p of z equals a naught plus a one z plus a two z squared all the way up to a n z to the n, and you wanna take the limit of that as z goes to z naught. Well, it's just going to end up being direct substitution. It's going to be p of z naught. Or in other words, you know, put, you'd have a naught plus a1 z naught plus a2 z naught squared all the way up to a sub n z naught to the n. Any complex polynomial function's limit can be evaluated by direct substitution. Great, because at this point, we don't have very many kinds of functions defined for complex numbers. I mean, we haven't made sense of anything like trigonometric functions and exponentials and logarithms. All we have at this point are polynomials and rational functions, and I think we defined root functions. Now, if you can evaluate the limit of a polynomial, 
then by the li the quotient limit law, you can evaluate limits of rational functions so long as you don't end up dividing by zero. Now, the proof of the limit of a polynomial is done by direct substitution here would just be taking the facts that you have up here about in yellow at the top, along with the limit rules that we established for sums and products, and stitch those together, and you can get that for a polynomial function also. So, so now, at this point, if you see a polynomial or a rational function, we're going to be able to evaluate limits no problem. Just substitute, essentially. Like, look at this example at the bottom here. We'll just do it like a Calculus 1 problem, essentially. Now, in this one, notice that when you try to plug in i, you get 0 in the denominator. So you can't initially do it by direct substitution. But, you know, that's a common sort of thing that happens when you're doing limits. And sometimes you can do a little razzle-dazzle, do a little algebra, and get it to the point where you can do the direct substitution that you know you can do. So, like on this one, I would factor the numerator into z minus i times z plus i. And then in the bottom, I've got z minus i. And then, aha, I s get my canceling stick out, and I cancel. And then I see that what I'm really taking the limit of here is just z plus i. Because this simplified function, z plus i, is equivalent to the original function, except for when z is equal to i. But when you're taking a limit, you don't care what's happening exactly at z equals i. You only wha care what happens as z is getting close to i. And those two functions are equivalent for values of z not equal to i. So you get, get the same limit. In any event, you've got it down to a polynomial. And you know from above that you can evaluate that by direct substitution. And you just plug in i, and you get i plus i equals 2i. So you may remember a little while ago we did a limit of z squared by breaking it into its component functions, and now we see we can do an even easier than that. All we got to do is just direct substitution. So it's getting easier as we go. Okay, so now that we pretty much have everything we need to do limits involving just ordinary complex numbers, we need to get into limits that involve infinity. Now, when you're thinking about real-valued limits, there's sort of two brands of infinity, right? There's negative infinity and positive infinity. But when you're dealing with complex numbers, there's just there's no negative direction or positive direction because the complex numbers form a plane. And so, you know, there's not left and right. There's all sorts of directions. So there's just going to be one infinity. And what we'd like to do is treat infinity as if it's just an ordinary complex number. So what we have to do to do that is... First, we just have to think of infinity as a point. And so it's going to seem a little strange at first, but we're going to define the extended complex plane to be just the complex plane joined together with a point, the point being infinity. Now, I know you might be thinking, you just can't put infinity in there. And think of infinity literally just as a point. Don't think of it as things are growing large or anything like that. It's just a symbol. And abstractly, it's, I'm just going to think of it as a point of a set. We'll call this um, the point at infinity. We'll give some meaning to it shortly, but for now, it's very abstract. Just It's just this point, and that's all there is to it. Don't think too mystically about it right now. So the C infinity, we can visualize it through a correspondence between a sphere, which we often call the Riemann sphere, which in this picture below is the sphere that you see sort of being cut through by this plane. And the plane there in yellow is the ordinary complex plane. So we've got this ordinary complex plane here, and I've got a sphere. doesn't really matter what the size of the sphere is, but it's centered at the origin of the complex plane. And so the complex plane is cutting right through this sphere through its equator. You can see that I've depicted the point at infinity off to the side there as sort of separate from the comp the regular complex plane. And then C infinity is that regular complex plane plus this other point that's sort of separate from it. When we put the points in the complex plane in correspondence with the sphere in the following way, some things will start to make some sense. So the way that we put the points in the plane in correspondence with points on the sphere is through a process called stereographic projection. So if you take any point in the plane, so in my picture there, you can see Z is down there in the plane. Draw a straight line from that point to the North Pole. Now that straight line is going to puncture the sphere at some point P. 
away from the North Pole. Like, you, you notice that that line will definitely not be tangent to the sphere. It'll puncture the sphere on its way going to the North Pole. And that's a unique correspondence. Every point in the plane has this unique sort of place where the line going from the North Pole to that point in the plane punctures the sphere. Even if you take a point sort of inside the equator, but, you know, in the complex plane, it'll puncture the sphere in the southern hemisphere. Now, there's only one point that doesn't get mapped to in this correspondence, and it's the point at infinity. So the point at infinity just corresponds to when you look at the line through the North Pole that's tangent to the sphere. When you draw that line that is tangent to that sphere at the North Pole, you can imagine that it goes through that point at infinity out there. That line is never going to touch the yellow regular complex plane, but imagine that it goes through this point at infinity. And that's the point that corresponds to the North Pole. So below the picture there, I have the correspondence set up. So regular points in the complex plane, just repeating myself here for emphasis, but regular points in the complex plane, each cor they correspond in a one-to-one -one way with points on that sphere that I'm calling S2. And that's called stereographic projection. And then the correspondence the only point on the sphere that doesn't have a partner in the plane is the North Pole, and the North Pole will correspond to this special point at infinity. The reason for setting up this correspondence like this is that it allows us to get our hands on the point at infinity by thinking of it as the North Pole of the sphere. Now, if I wanted to talk about a neighborhood of infinity, it would correspond to a neighborhood of actual points on the sphere around the North Pole. So it turns this sort of ephemeral infinity point that's floating out there in the void to an actual tangible point on the sphere. And when I talk about a neighborhood of the North Pole, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Just draw a little circle around the North Pole on the sphere there, and you got like some sort of like little region on the sphere that you can put your hands on and talk about. Let me get into that down here. So if you pick an epsilon larger than zero, and usually when someone's talking about epsilon, they're thinking of it as a very small positive quantity. So think of epsilon as tiny, you know, like one one millionth or something like that. And then you look at a circle of radius one over epsilon, well, that's going to be a really big radius, right? Well, if you look at the exterior of a circle of radius one over epsilon centered at the origin, then I've got that depicted in blue down there at the bottom. If you stereographically project all those blue points up onto the sphere, you get this sort of deleted neighborhood around the North Pole. And if you go ahead and include the fact that we map infinity to the North Pole, you get a complete regular neighborhood of the North Pole up there that I've kind of got shaded a slightly different color, kind of a aqua color. Again, repeating, the blue stuff in the picture in the plane, including the infinity, when you map them stereographically, it becomes a neighborhood of the North Pole. And so for that reason, we call those blue points in the, compl in the extended complex plane the neighbor a neighborhood of infinity. So neighborhoods of infinity have this, um, have this, this description here. They're the points Z with, where their modulus is, is greater than 1 over epsilon, where epsilon is some small positive quantity. So see, now when we're talking about a neighborhood of infinity, you can actually make some sort of physical sense out of it if you th think about the correspondence on the sphere. Sometimes this Riemann sphere is called the one-point compactification of the complex, complex plane. It sort of just wraps up infinity to the North Pole. Anyway, why we want to have neighborhoods of infinity is that when you describe limits, you may remember our definition of limit involved neighborhoods. I gave you one version of the definition of limit that said, you know, the limit as z approaches z naught of f of z equals w naught if for every epsilon there exists a delta so that when you take the image un under f of the neighborhood of z naught, then it lies inside of the epsilon neighborhood of w naught. So if we want to talk about limits involving infinity, now we can use that same exact language but just convert it to, you know, instead of a limit of z, or a, instead of talking about a neighborhood of z naught, we can talk about a neighborhood of infinity. Or similarly, if we need to talk about a neighborhood of w naught, we can talk about 
a neighborhood of infinity. Let me show you how that goes here. So we're going to do limits at infinity and infinite limits. So we have three definitions that we need to do to get sort of all the cases. The first kind of limit is the limit where z is going to infinity. But the limit itself is working out to be some just finite w naught value. So what do we mean by that? The limit as z goes to infinity of f of z equals w naught. It just means this. For every epsilon greater than 0, there exists a delta greater than 0, such that for all complex numbers, so I need to say z if z is in the neighborhood of infinity of size 1 over epsilon, so I'd write that as modulus of z is greater than 1 over, well this time it's going to be delta, so if z is in a 1 over delta neighborhood of infinity, that implies that f of z is within epsilon of w naught. So this first part here is just saying z in 1 over delta neighborhood of infinity implies that, and then on this side it's saying z is in epsilon neighborhood of w naught. Of the three definitions that are on this page, I have memorized none of them. It's just that I understand conceptually that I'm replacing you know, either a neighborhood of z naught or a neighborhood of w naught with the appropriate neighborhood of infinity. I really only have the first definition of me limit memorized and then I'm modifying it as needed. In the second definition here, we're taking a limit, this time z is approaching some finite value z naught, but the limit itself is working out to be infinity. What does that mean? Well, it always starts the same. For every epsilon greater than zero, there exists a delta greater than zero, such that for every c in the complex numbers. Okay, this time, I want to say if z is in a delta neighborhood of z naught, so that'd be z minus z naught less than delta also needs to be greater than zero to exclude z being equal to z naught. That will imply, okay, now I want f of z to be forced to be in a 1 over epsilon neighborhood of infinity. So that would be modulus of f of z has got to be greater than 1 over epsilon. So this expression is just saying z is in the delta neighborhood of z naught. And this expression is saying that f of z is in the 1 over epsilon neighborhood of infinity. The third variety of these infinite limits is when z is going to infinity results in f of z also going to infinity. My infinity is kind of poorly drawn there. Let me make it look nicer. Looks a little better. So for this one, it starts off the same as always. For every epsilon greater than zero, there exists a delta greater than zero, such that for every complex number, okay, we want to say if z is in a one over delta neighborhood of infinity, so modulus of z being greater than 1 over delta, that implies, then we want to say f of z is in a 1 over epsilon neighborhood of infinity. So that'd be modulus f of z is greater than 1 over epsilon. So again, interpreting this in red here, z is in 1 over delta neighborhood of infinity. And then this one is f of z is in 1 over epsilon neighborhood of infinity. I hope that you're getting the gist of that. It's really the same definition over and over. You're just replacing, in the original definition of limit, the neighborhood of infinity in the appropriate way. We want to get to the point where we can calculate limits that involve infinity. And what's really cool is that with our definition, we can take any limit involving infinity and convert it to a limit that does not involve infinity. So that's what the nature of this theorem is. And the first part of it says, all right, if, if z is going to z naught and you look at 1 over f of z and you're getting 0, 
Well, when you take one and you divide by a gigantic thing, you get something close to zero, right? So the idea here is that if one over f of z is going to zero, that must mean that f of z in the denominator there must be getting really big. So we can say that this means that the limit as z approaches z naught of f of z must be infinity. So let's say that you have some limit, and you, you know from looking at it, your conjecture is, looks like the limit's infinity to me. Well then, if you could prove this other limit here was equal to zero, if you, if you prove that the limit of the reciprocal of the function is equal to zero, then you will have proven your original aim to show that f of z goes to infinity. But notice that the limit in green doesn't involve any infinities. It's just a limit of ordinary finite values. So that's the idea of how you would use this. To answer the question about the limit in blue, if you can answer the question about the limit in green, then you'll have your answer. In the second limit, we got z is going to zero, and then f of one over z is equal to w naught. Well, if z is going to zero, you know that one over z is going to infinity, right? So it's like the, the inside parameter of your function is going to infinity. So really, this converts out to, you're just saying that the limit as z goes to infinity of f of z is equal to w naught. So again, you know, the idea here is that that limit in yellow doesn't involve any infinities. It's all f regular finite complex numbers. So if, if you have a limit like the one in blue on the right, you think, hey, I need to evaluate this limit as z goes to infinity, and it looks like it's coming out to this fixed value w naught. Well, I could convert that to the limit in yellow and argue that instead. And then the last one here, you got basically the combination of what's happening in green and yellow above. If z is going to zero, you know that one over z is going to infinity. And then if one over f of something is going to zero, that must mean that the f itself is going to infinity. So this converts out to limit as z goes to infinity of f of z is equal to infinity. Again, the limit that I'm highlighting in blue here does not have any infinities in it. It's all finite values. And so if I wanted to answer this question about infinite limits on the right, I could convert it to the one in blue. So let me give you a sense of how one of these proofs goes. They're all kind of the same or, you know, similar in, in nature how you go about proving them. So maybe I'll prove the second one, and if you want to try to modify that proof to answer the other ones, you could. Okay, so for the second one, like suppose limit as z goes to zero of f of one over z is equal to w naught. And then I'm gonna let epsilon be positive. Then we had a definition on the previous page of what this kind of limit means. It means that if I take an arbitrary epsilon, there has to exist a delta so that if z is within delta of zero, because z is going to zero in this problem, then the f of one over z must be getting within epsilon of w naught. So let's write that down. Then there exists some delta greater than zero, such that for every complex number, if z satisfies, z is in a neighborhood of zero, but not equal to zero. So zero less than modulus z minus zero, is less than delta, then we know that f of 1 over z minus w has to be less than epsilon. In other words, f of 1 over z must be within epsilon of w naught. Okay, and then I want to make the argument about, well, if, if, if I take the limit as z goes to infinity of just f of z, I would get w naught. So basically, it just amounts to a substitution. So we're going to let z hat be equal to 1 over z. And observe that if, so we're going to do z is going to infinity, so we want to sort of set up a 1 over delta neighborhood of infinity here. So, so if z hat in modulus is greater than 1 over delta, so this just means z hat in a 1 over delta neighborhood of infinity, um, then that implies that since, since z hat is 1 over z, I get 1 over z is greater than 1 over delta. And that in turn, you know, if I reciprocate both sides, this tells me modulus of z is less than delta. 
And also, I know that z is not equal to zero because I said z hat is one over z. Of course, you know, I mean for z hat to be a complex number. Maybe I'll just mention up here z not equal to zero, right? So from there, I could say that it's certainly true that zero less than modulus z minus zero is less than delta. The reason I wrote it out like that was because if I look right here, I know that whenever that inequality is satisfied, that it implies something else. So thus, we have modulus f of 1 over z minus w naught is less than epsilon because if the top inequality there in green is satisfied, then it tells me that this inequality in red must be satisfied, right? But then we just remember that 1 over z is z hat, so that tells me the modulus of f of z hat minus w naught is less than epsilon. So let me do some highlighting to sort of stitch together what's important here in this whole proof. I'm going to use yellow. So I started with an epsilon bigger than zero. I showed that there exists a delta greater than zero such that for any z hat, in the complex numbers, for any z hat in the complex numbers, if this inequality is satisfied, so if z hat is in a na 1 over delta neighborhood of infinity, then we arrived at this inequality was satisfied. So the conclusion, what I just proved then, is that, therefore, the limit as z hat goes to infinity of f of z hat is equal to w naught, which is exactly what I wanted to prove. I mean, yeah, it's got a different variable in it, z hat instead of z, but that's okay. But anyway, that's the that's the proof. Yeah, I would really encourage you to try to prove one of these other ones, and perhaps I'll even have it be on a homework. Let's see how you can use this this last theorem. It's pretty cool. I'll do a couple of examples just how you can use it to compute things. I want to look at this limit. Z is approaching negative 1. I got IZ plus 3 over Z plus 1. Now, first thing I'm going to do is just think about what happens if I plug in negative 1 in place of Z. Well, I see that in the numerator I get like negative I plus 3, which is not 0. And then in the bottom you do get 0. So this is like something, something non-zero over 0, which I kind of think of in my mind as like infinity. So I'm thinking... I'm thinking my conjecture here is that the limit is infinity, is, is the answer. And so if I want to prove that the limit, and I've got z is approaching some finite value, but then the limit is infinity, if I can just show that the reciprocal of this limit, the, or the reciprocal, the limit of the reciprocal is equal to zero, that's the first part of that theorem, I think, that we just covered. If we show that the limit of the reciprocal is zero, then that'll show that the limit, the original limit, is equal to infinity. Well, we see that the limit as z approaches negative one of the reciprocal would be like this. And then, because this is a rational function, which I know because I have the quotient limit rule, and I know that polynomials can be evaluated by direct substitution, then basically I can evaluate this by direct substitution and I get zero over whatever, negative i plus three, but that's equal to zero. And so by the previous theorem, I can conclude that that original limit as z approaches negative one, i z plus three over z plus one is equal, infin equal to infinity. And, you know, and from this example, you can see that this is generally true for any polynomial function or for any rational function that if if you go to if you try to direct substitute into a rational function and you get something not zero divided by zero the answer is infinity automatically unlike in calculus 1 you'd have to think about positive infinity and negative infinity and maybe do one-sided limits that doesn't concept doesn't even make sense here to do one-sided limits you just get one infinity that's it let's take a look at this one so here we've got a z is going to infinity. You know, I'm thinking about converting this to a kind of limit that doesn't involve z going to infinity, but rather z goes to zero. The limit, um, when I think about z going to infinity, you know, the numerator and the denominator are both 
second degree polynomials. So I suspect that the limit's just going to end up being two divided by I because those are the leading coefficients, just like in calculus one, you know, you read off the reading coefficients to get the limit. But I want to check that that's true according to that theorem. So the one, the one of those theorems that said that if z is going to infinity and then the function's coming out to some finite value, w naught, to get something that verifies that, you just replace z with one over z and let z go to zero. We can do this, like we see that. The limit as z goes to zero, of take that expression and replace z with one over z. So you get two times one over z squared plus i times one over z minus three over i times one over z squared plus three i minus seven. You know, at this point, I could take this limit and just multiply the numerator into the denominator by z squared which I'd really just be multiplying by one, right? Doing that, a little bit of arithmetic here. We get limit of z goes to zero, and then in the numerator, you're gonna get two, and then plus i times z, and then minus three z squared. And then down in the denominator, you would get i plus three i z squared minus seven z squared. And now you can, do direct substitution because you've got a you got a rational function and substituting zero does not result in zero in the denominator it just results in two divided by i so like basically the gist is all these pieces with the z in them are going to zero right and you're left with two over i so that original limit with the infinity in it the point here was that by substituting one over z in place of z, I converted it to a limit as z approaches zero, which then I can handle without having to think about some sort of ephemeral point at infinity. So I guess the, the overall sort of lesson to be learned is that, you know, there's a correspondence between zero and infinity through the function one over z. So replacing z with one over z interchanges zeros and infinities. That's all, the ha that's all that theorem, the previous theorem with the three parts, basically all it says, which is kind of cool. All right, I think that's all I have for you today. So I'll go ahead and stop there.